Love is what some of us desire most. Respect is what some of us most desperately need. No matter where we seek it, whether it may be from coworkers, friends, family, or even fans, it just seems to be slightly out of reach. Should we demand respect at other people's expense? Should we clamor for love at all costs? As we flounder in our daily encounter with others, the perfect model of relationship was right before our eyes all along. Jesus didn't just meet us in our humanity, he lives among us in humility. He showed us that being in submission to others isn't weakness, it is meekness. And that is the key to love and respect between friends and strangers, spouses and family. Through each aspect of our lives, God proves to us that He is immeasurably more. Great to see you, Purpose Church. So good to be together here online. Today we're going to continue our series, Immeasurably More, a verse-by-verse study of the book of Ephesians. Now last week, uh, Pastor Eric preached on the kind of life that pleases God. And our theme verse last Sunday was Ephesians 5, verse 10. And find out what pleases the Lord. Uh, Paul continues in verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So now, Paul is going to apply this same principle to marriage, the kind of marriage that pleases God. So because we're talking on marriage, I've asked my wonderful wife, Kimberly, uh, to teach along with me. So take it away. Well, it's a hard passage, and we're not going to lie that it's, uh, it's easy. So we'll just jump right in together um, to the key to it all is from Ephesians 5, verse 21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, in the pagan world, this would have been a very shocking passage. To us, we have other visceral responses to the word submit, but in those days, it would have been revolutionary because women were sim- simply had no standing in the community whatsoever. Uh, the husband had all the power and all the authority. Women, basically a wife, belonged to her husband. She's not only to serve him, but to obey his demands. She was a plaything possibly an object of his lust and of no real value and could be dismissed at any time. We have a a sentence here that a quote from Dr. Lawrence O. Richard who said, what a contrast with the pagan view. Suddenly things are reversed. The wife is transformed from an unimportant adjunct who exists only to meet her husband's needs to a person of intrinsic worth and value, becoming the focus of her husband's concern. Instead of demanding that she live for him, he begins to live for her. Rather than keeping her under, he seeks to lift her up. This would be the key to marriage, according to Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to give the population a new look. Now we aren't the way that the pagans existed. Now we aren't the way that the old culture, Christianity brought a new way of marriage. And I think today, would, wouldn't we all want that kind of a marriage? Wouldn't we all like to be fulfilled and to have exactly what God would have wanted for us? In fact, his plan for us is to have a solid, fulfilling marriage. Remember the verse um, from Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God has plans for us, for a hope and a future. They're not to hurt us, not to harm us, but it's for our good, for us to prosper and to have a happy, successful family life. And so if you're listening today, rather, just don't let that word submit scare you off because we're gonna talk that it's been taken out of context, that the word has been abused and and, and somehow set out through the population of our current culture that says it's a bad word. What it does not say, let's take a look at that. It does not say that women as a whole should submit to men as a whole. It doesn't even say men and women. It says husbands and wives. 
doesn't say that wives are less than or subordinate to or inferior to their husbands. It does say, it doesn't say that husbands are better than or superior or created to dominate over. It does not say women obey your husbands. In fact, no reliable Bible translation says anywhere wives obey your husbands. That word is not used in the marital terms. It's perhaps for children obeying their parents, but not within the context of marriage. In fact, a commentator, Walter Liefeld, or Liefeld says to submit means to yield one's own rights. If the relationship called for it is in the military, then the term could connote obedience, but that meaning is not called for here. In fact, the word obey does not appear in scripture with respect to wives, but only with children. So if we know what it does not say, what does it say? And that's what we're gonna take a look at now. The verse 21 of Ephesians 5 says to submit. To submit means to lift up, to honor, to respect, to yield. Now remember, this is submit one unto another. So the verse goes on to say, submit, lift, honor, yet yield, respect to one another. That means both of us are doing this yielding, respecting, honoring, yielding unto one another. It's a team approach. It brings unity. It's a mutuality. And it's done out of reverence for Christ, honoring God, lifting him up, not because your spouse is necessarily submitting to you or even if they f- you feel that they deserve it right at that moment. It's got nothing to do when you feel like it. It is an authoritative uh, for both the husband and the wife. In fact, you don't submit to each other because you are worthy, but because Christ is worthy. And let's take it, let's get into it a little deeper. We're gonna go into the woods now on wives and then Glenn, you're gonna take husbands in a little bit, right? So I'm gonna start with Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, this is revolutionary. Once I've said again, our tendency in the modern era is to be a little bit, you know, kind of hits us wrong, the word submit, and we know that it doesn't mean obey. We know it means to honor. Um, Today, we might feel it limits us, but it's actually life-affirming for wives. And if we can look at it that way, it's not because the husband demands it or domineers us, but even if um, we've decided he is or is not uh, deserving, we submit because the Lord is willing. And that's really the key. We lift up our spouse because we are lifting up Jesus by doing so. When we obey commands from Jesus, when then we're honoring everyone around us because everyone benefits when we honor him. There'll be more about that when Glenn gets to the, to the Paul section on, uh, on husbands. Um, but we don't put the husband, again, in place of our affection and honoring of the Lord, but rather that we submit to the husband as a way to honor and and glorify Jesus. Let's make, to take this even a little further in here, because this is really helpful to me. Um, The imago dei, which means the image of God. It's a Latin word, imago dei, the image of God. And we read about it in Genesis 1, 27, the very first book of the Bible. We're 27 verses in, and we already see the verse. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created both male and female. No other genders, if you notice, there's only two genders that he created, male and female, and he created them in his own image with qualities like his own. So this is really cool. We have been made in God's image. We bear his image. That means we have a soul, uh, we have a spirit, we have a being, we have unique value to God above all other creatures, even our precious dogs or any other creature that you love, you can't believe. No soul, but rather we have the soul and the image of God. Um, we have thoughts and ideas and planning and, and a concept of eternity. That isn't in any other creature. That comes from the image of God. We have feelings, we have opinions, and there's no other creature in creation. He blessed us with his own image. He chose to make us that way. So that means our value comes from being being with the imago Dei, the image of God. And guess what? This is where it comes really fun. That means the person you're married to has the image of God. (laughs) That's kind of freaky, huh? Okay, so I I really encourage you to try this at home. Um, You know, when you get done watching this, is to 
do what I do. And believe it or not, you didn't know that I do this. I did not know you did this. I've been doing this for probably like 10 years. I was at a, a conference, Christian conference, and the, and the um, pastor said, I want you to take the hands of this, another individual and I want you to look in their eyes and see that image of God that we know from Genesis 1, uh, 1 chapter uh, 27, God has put into your spouse. God has, everyone you look at has the image of God. They are the bearers of God's image. So when I am frustrated with my husband, which is Rarely hardly event. ever. Hardly ever. But I would look at you, and even when, you know, we're getting along. Long. But then during an argument or during a disagreement or a time when you are showing characteristics, I did not know that you had, even while we were dating, mm-hmm. we've been married almost 41 years. So if you didn't know that, that might help you understand. So I look for the image of God and you know what? It's crazy. But when I realize that God created you uniquely, he poured himself into you. How in the world could I not love and care for you and respect you as I do Christ? Because I realize that is who you are. And am I? And I am too. I am, when you look at me, you've got to start trying to do that now. So now let's go on a little further because Paul continues in uh, Ephesians 5 now in verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, remember how we had uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, We talked about it a little earlier, uh, that God designed this plan. He established his church under the headship of Christ. There has to be a head. There has to be a bot for the body of Christ to operate properly. There has to be a buck stops here person whenever life gets hard or dis- decisions get hard or saying the word decisions gets hard. Imagine if we didn't have Christ as the head of the church. We would have wandered off track a long, long time ago. But when we come under his authority, it brings unity. It brings harmony. And that is what Christ is call- uh, calling us to, that the, that the man is, the husband is the head to the wife. Now, verse 24, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I hope this is beginning to make sense now, that wives submit, which is, we know the word submit means to give honor and respect and attention to their husbands because we know from Jeremiah, it's a plan for our good and it's not for evil, it's not to hurt us, it's a plan to give us a hope and a future just as he has done for the church. And that is what the wives take away from this. Now it's the husband's turn, and there is almost three times as much material <laughs> to challenge husbands as there is to challenge wives. But this is, do and, not go and get a drink or a uh, cookie uh, or something uh, right yeah, now. Yeah, stick yeah, around. Yeah, stick around. So I believe that the reason there's three times as much uh, for the wives' part uh, is basically flowing from the culture. Uh, the wives' part is basically flowing kind of with the culture of that time. But the husband's part was totally revolutionary. We are talking Paul's words are like lightning across a darkened sky. Revolutionary and countercultural when it was written and even for today as well. So first of all, Paul talks about loving your wife uh, as Christ loved the church. He says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, how in the world do you have power and the ability to do this. It's supernatural. It is not natural. Well, back in verse 18, uh, we saw the verse earlier, be filled with the Spirit. It's only Jesus living in you uh, that, can, that can in any way uh, begin to do this. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, one of the most practical things, um, it, it doesn't sound practical, but it is, that you can do in marriage is just when you're having a tough time, you're having a disagreement, it, it's getting hard, you call on the name of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus, 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 please take over this moment. Jesus, 
would your words, would you say your words through me, my thoughts, your thoughts through me, uh, your actions, your heart through me, take over this moment in our relationship and live your life through me. And just calling on the name of Jesus has helped us many times when we... Uh, as parents have, too, as parents in every relationship, in, every in any relationship. hardship, the name of Jesus. Call on Jesus with your boss at work, you know. <laughs> um, then Paul talks about loving your wife is a way to love yourself. You know, sometimes we're supposed to do things in Scripture just because it's the right thing to do. Okay. But sometimes we need a little extra motivation. And sometimes God gives us even a selfish motivation uh, to do the right thing. He says in verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Loving your wife is loving Yourself, uh, Paul wrote in Colossians chapter three, verse nineteen. He says, "Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them." So I, I've got good news, bad news, and then some more good news. Good news is there's a positive motivation here. Do this, God says, and you're actually loving yourself. L love your wife, and God will bless you. But there's also a negative motivation. Don't do this, and God won't bless you. Peter puts it this way. He says, one of the scariest verses in all the Bible for, for me, <laughs> yeah, or for any of us. For guys. Yes, for guys. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, meaning physically weaker, physically weaker. And, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Oh my goodness. That means maybe the bad news is the reason why God has not been blessing me as much as I want him to bless me or, or even answering my prayers is because I am not being considerate and I'm not being respectful. If I am not being considerate and I am not respecting, uh, it is hindering my prayers. Now let's get back to good news again. I think you can flip that verse. I think you can infer um, I believe that if you are considerate of your wife, even when it's not the natural thing to do, when you treat her with respect, even when you don't feel like doing it, that God will supersize mm -hmm. your prayers. Supercharge. Uh, exactly. Turbo Turbocharge. Turbocharge your prayers. I feel like the, the wind behind me in my prayers when I'm considerate to Kimberly and when I treat her with respect. And then the third thing Paul says here is make your wife your priority. He says in verse 29, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, now he quotes some Genesis, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So the first thing the husband learns when, when you get married is to make his wife the priority over his parents. That, that's kind of the first leave, uh, battle. Leave and cleave. Leave and cleave. Leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife. May, she now becomes your number one priority. And, and I know this was actually a few years into our marriage, but this came, became a point of decision um, uh, for me. I, I realized that Kimberly, for the first years of our marriage, has supported my dream. And my dream was to pastor a church. I just I lived for it 24-7. Just uh, how can you build a church? How can you grow a church? I, I was pretty obsessed with that dream. And Kimberly supported it. But God convicted me a few years into marriage. I think it was about like six years of mar marriage or so. That's when we, we kind of hit, hit a point where we needed some help and needed to make some adjustments, changes. And I realized I needed to support Kimberly's dream as much as she was supporting my dream. Now, Kimberly's dream, she's always had this passion for children at risk or children in need. And, and she had always dreamed of adopting. And, and not just one at a time, but didn't want sibling groups separated, wanted to keep siblings together. Now, when we were dating, she'd say, oh, you know, my dream uh, is to someday, maybe we'll have a couple of children on our own, birth children, but then I'd like to go and adopt. Now, I, I want to confess to you, that thought had never <laughs> crossed my mind. Never thought about that. 
clueless. But because I wanted to keep dating her, I was like, are you kidding me? That's my dream too. Ever since I was a little boy, that's all I thought about. We really? must be soulmates. Really? Let, yes, let's, oh. let's get married. This is meant to be. And I thought it would fade, youthful, you know, ideas. Uh, it'll fade over time. Is, is, well, it didn't. It didn't. And I still remember the moment in St. Joseph's Hospital, I guess, up in Syracuse, New York. Um, she's got Leah in her arms. Brand new baby. Brand new baby. Uh, Abby, two years old, Less standing by the yeah. bed. <laughs> and she goes, we're going to go get our boys. And I'm like, yeah. She, it didn't fade. It's still there. But God told me she has supported your dreams. Now it's your turn to support her dreams. So we went to Columbia, South America, Kali, Columbia, to an orphanage and adopted uh, John and Andrew, which has been uh, such an unbelievable blessing within our lives. Boy. Uh, but when we had the plans, beginning to form the plans to do that, my parents and my whole side of the family um, were freaked out, <laughs> were skeptical, thinking, and they loved Kimberly. My my sisters loved Kimberly. My parents loved Kimberly. Everybody loved Kimberly. But they thought, this crazy girl has gotten <laughs> our son into some crazy stuff. And, and I should have been warned. I mean, God couldn't make it more clear. Her maiden name was Hazard. I mean, and God is in heaven saying, Glenn, could I have made it any more clear? She will be hazardous to your comfort zone is what she will do. She will stretch you out of your comfort zone. So, so I remember my dad was the one assigned and you could just tell that my sisters and my mother were like, you've, you've got to call Glenn. He always listens to you. And I did. I, I was one of those that always listened to my dad. You know what I mean? But I hadn't obeyed my dad. He hadn't given me and told me to do something since my teen years. So it had been 15 years since my dad had told me to do something or told me not to do something. But he's on the phone. I remember he was just so hesitant. He goes, Glenn, we're really worried about this. Uh, we, we just wonder if this is wise. But I had to stand firm. My wife was now my new number one priority. And I said, Dad, I, have, I love you and I've always respected you and, and, and tried to do it you said, but no, we're going to do this. This is something we are going uh, to do. And of course, eventually they realized turned with all their arguments. Turned out great. Turned out they great. Yeah. Our absolutely. Boys. Absolutely. So wonderful. Now, then the other part of this, around the same time, was to make Kimberly my priority over work. And this is always a struggle for us guys, for all of us, all of women us, and to, men. women and men, to make the, the, the spouse the priority over work. Now, it's especially hard for pastor's wives because you are now competing with God. <laughs> you're not competing with his job, you're competing with God. God exactly. Oh, God, man, he's, at wor very he's down at the church. Uh, yeah, in fact, yeah. I always say that yeah. dad's at work. Yeah. I don't say dad's at church. Yeah, that's right. She's work. done that from the beginning. Never so that didn't want the kids to hate church. Hate, we don't have to hate God because dad's always there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I had to learn to, to, to shift that priority. Now, just a little bit of grandfatherly advice to the young people that are watching or younger people within our church family. Uh, here's, here's a little something to think about. Make your family your priority early in life when it is so tempting to make your job or your career the ultimate priority. You know, you just, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you want to you make it. It's a drive. And so what happens is you end up peaking too soon in your job and leaving your wife and kids behind. What do I mean by that? You, you put your career and job first and your, your family after that, you know what'll happen is you'll peak probably in your 40s, I'm gonna say, your 40s, you'll peak. And this is what we call a midlife crisis. So you peak in your career and your job, three, three things happen. Maybe you left your wife behind, the relationship's not there. Maybe you left your kids behind. You've missed out on your relationship with them. Frankly, you will probably get bored with work. If you peak in your 40s and you got 20 years till retirement, you're going to tell. Now, hold it off. And I know it's hard sometimes with, I know our daughters with that, going through that right now, which job to take that's more family friendly. And, and, it, and it's hard. The timing of these things is, is, is difficult. It's not always perfect. But as much as you can, to make your family your priority early on. 
So now that's going to make you peak in your career a little bit later, in your 50s instead of your 40s. But you'll get to that place in your career and job where you're fulfilled in that, you, you've achieved that, but you brought your wife along, your spouse, your spouse, I'm sorry, your spouse along with you. This is advice for men and women. Bring your spouse along with you. You've got a relationship with your kids. You finally get to where you want to be in your career. And then maybe you got 10 years till retirement, 15. You're not going to get bored. You're going to run through the finish line. So that's just something, a little bit of helpful Grandpa Glenn uh, <laughs> advice to those pop, of you pop. that, that are that are pop, pop, all, all right. our grandkids. So this is sounding. I hope you're starting to warm up to this whole idea. But this is where it can go awry. This is where we call it the crazy cycle. This is where this idea of mutual submission one and to the other from verse 21 can really be problematic, because. What happens in this cycle is that the wife, uh, let's see, we're coming from, the wife is wanting to ha be, have be loved and feel that respect and, or love, and then the husband wants to be respected, but he's waiting until the wife uh, loves, respects him, and she's waiting to be loved, and then he's waiting to be respected, and it gets crazy. Nobody's getting exactly what it is that they need, and so everybody holds back, and it's crazy. I'm not going to love. I'm not going to love you until you respect me, and then you say, oh, well, I'm not going to respect you until you love Thank you. me. Thank yeah, you. Right, I got confused on that. Yeah. But you know, it's like two kids playing on the playground. You go first. No, you go first. I'm not going to go till you go first. It's from Ephesians 5.33. Oh, Ephesians 5.33, which says that... Uh, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her her husband. It is a, 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 a process. It does take a lot of mutuality and a lot of balance. And so what we do to counteract that is he loves not waiting for respect and she respects not waiting for love. It's kind of called the redeeming cycle or the cycle that pulls us out of the crazy cycle. You'll see it up here on the screen. Right now. And what's amazing about that is that that is very biblical and we happen to know that there's a whole teaching on it that we are offering at our church, right? right. That it is purposechurch.com slash marriage has all of our marriage resources here at Purpose Church. And one of the things that they'll be holding starting April 14th here on campus mm -hmm. yep. at uh, during the 11.30 service. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go on over. It's a video series. You can go to church at 10 and then stay Ooh. afterwards at 11.30. Good right plan. There. And it gives you the opportunity to understand how this principle works, how to break out of that crazy cycle, how to give love, how to receive love, how to give respect, receive respect. In fact, we also recommend on that website, you'll see that we recommend the book Five Languages of Love is a wonderful thing. Our website is just full of resources. We have mentoring couples here at the church that will meet with you. We have um, a list of counselors and therapists that we'd be welcome, you'd be welcome to avail yourselves of. The church of. will pay for the first few sessions to help you get started on that, to see if it's worthwhile for you or not. And Pastor Lisa and her husband Gary just do a wonderful job with this. And it just goes through all the aspects of marriage where you might be at right now, whether your marriage is really struggling and you're, this is like really tough to think about, or if you're doing pretty well, but you wanna make it even better. So step into that website and take a look at that. Now, when you compare your marriage, our marriage, to what Christ did for the church, you can get discouraged because it is the ideal. And so you're tempted to ask the question, can God use a flawed marriage like ours for his purposes? And the answer is a resounding yes. So for the, the few minutes that we have left here, the remainder of our time, let's look at a very flawed marriage. It's Abraham and Sarah. And uh, we're just gonna hit a few of the high and low points, and we're not even gonna talk about when Abraham asked Sarah to lie and tell people that she was his sister. And he did that not once, twice. but twice. Uh, let the record show that I've never asked you to tell people that you were for, my sister. I, 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 good for you, honey. Yeah, Yay, there's one for Glenn. <laughs> so uh, here's God's plan. Uh, Genesis 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, 
What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. According to the law of that day, it was the code of Hammurabi, was kind of the law of the land. If Abraham didn't have a child, his head servant would inherit his estate. Goes on, verse 3, and Abram said, you have given me no children. He's almost accusing God here, frustrated with God. Uh, So a servant in my own household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, having that encounter with God, you would think that Abraham would feel incredibly empowered and, and, um, and blessed and ready to go. And yet, strangely, as so often happens, their pl- their, Abraham and Sarah came up with their own plan to hurry God along because they were impatient. So let's see how they think that they can fix it in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 3. Now, Sarai, uh, Sarah in, was Abraham's wife, uh, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And so as was done in those days, she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. So you go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now in those days in ancient pagan world, this was not uncommon because families needed to grow children, high infant mortality rate, high uh, maternal uh, death rate. And so families, sometimes men had to take several wives, concubines, have many children. They needed uh, people to work the farm, the agriculture. They needed people to inherit the the farm, the, the, the ownings, the land. And they also needed them for warring. I mean, if they went to war, they'd need families. So having a big family, and if, especially if you had a wife who hadn't had children yet. Um, so she comes up with this idea that other people were doing in the pagan world, but certainly not somebody who had just spoken with God didn't really need to do this. But Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, so she'd been their slave girl for 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. This is not, this made sense to them, I guess, but it, it's going to just be disaster as we're going to be able to watch how it forced God's hand. Can I bring up the other couple that this makes me think of? Sure. Adam and Eve. Yeah. Does this remind you at all of Adam and Eve where God spoke to Adam and said, don't eat from the tree of, in the garden of the knowledge of, of good and evil. Uh, and he gave the command directly to Adam. But then Eve had an idea that that fruit looked good. And so she took a bite and then he thought, oh, well, yeah. That, and she said, here, have some. <laughs> now it was inspired by the enemy, Satan, but he knew the command of God and yet he still caved to Eve. And that reminds me a lot of what Sarah was. She comes up with this aberrant idea. He agrees to it and he should have known better. Um, He should have with uh, lovingly held back his wife and said, you know, Sarah, I know this seems like a good idea to you that we could somehow use this pagan tradition of our day and, and have him, you know, create a baby with Hagar. But he gave up his really his God given role to protect and love his family and his wife, especially by limiting them to God plan for them and nothing more. And it completely backfires. <laughs> uh, verse four, he slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she saw that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And Abraham thinks to himself, but it was your idea. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, your idea. <laughs> now, we, we know he didn't say it out loud because his life would have ended right there if he had. End of the Bible, the End of the story of <laughs> Abraham within the Bible, at, at least. And, uh, and, but he, 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 he does this. And so it leads to verse 6. And you'll just see even more hurt and pain. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Again, he kind of passively doesn't doesn't take the lead there to say, hey, um, no, we've made a mistake. 
Um, we, we, we caved once, but let's not make a double mistake. Let's not make a mistake on top of a mistake. Just do it there or whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar so that, uh, so that she fled from her. It's like he abdicates his authority. Not that he was, would in any way be damaging her, but rather to love her, care for her, provide boundaries for her so that their family could grow according to God's plan. Sad. Well, what happens is God says, okay, Abraham, you kind of missed out. So he restates the plan in Genesis 17, verses 16 through 19. He comes back to Abraham. God says, I will bless her, Sarah, and I will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man who's a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, uh, or Abraham said, now look at if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. See, once again, he's trying to correct God. You don't understand. And this is a God where the possible, impossible is always possible. And Abraham knew that. But God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And then uh, what happens after this is finally God's plan is fulfilled. Chapter 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. You know, so much of our sin and the pain and hurt that uh, results from that sin comes from our impatience to wait for God's plan to be fulfilled. It's the shortcuts that get us in trouble rather than waiting on God's timing. Uh, We run ahead of God and do things in our own way and it gets us in trouble and it brings trouble to those around us as well. Well, that's exactly what happens because the, the, the trauma is already in motion and uh, it's just kind of cycling downwards. Uh, ultimately, God is sovereign. But in the meantime, there's going to be some heartache. And it continues in Genesis 21, verses 8 through 13. The child grew, Isaac, and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, which would have been about age two to three, Abraham held a great feast, but Sarah saw that the son, now look what we're calling him, the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, never mind that he was her son. Remember, that's how the child was, the ancient custom, the child was, had been raised by her for like 14 years. He was mocking, he's a teenager, and she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman's and her son, For that woman's son, calling Hagar that woman's son that had been with her for 25 years, he will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Well, the matter distressed Abram greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to what Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac, that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. So the plan was disastrous and it continued through, now we're 14 years into this plan and it did cause hurt and pain to everyone. Think of Hagar and Ishmael leaving the only home they'd ever known. And it really started with the misplaced submission in the marriage. We can see that Abram is the one who spoke with God. He should have been the one to hold them accountable to God and it escalated from there. If Abram would have led his family and loved his family, his wife, enough to hold himself and them accountable, Sarah would have submitted, if she had submitted. And I, really the, the end of the story is that there's a war right now in the Middle East, and it is between those who are the descendants of Ishmael and who consider themselves going back to the line of Ishmael, to those who are the descendants of Isaac, who trace their roots back to Isaac 4,000 years ago. They are at war right now in the Middle East, started with a lack of submission and love in a marriage, mutual submission. But here's the thing. God takes a tough situation Um, even says in verse 13, I'll make the son of the slave into a nation also. So he was going to bless Hagar and Ishmael. God takes this tough situation. He redeems it for Ishmael and Hagar, and he redeems it for Abraham and Sarah. 
and he'll do the same for our marriages as well. God works despite our brokenness. And in Hebrews chapter 11, in what we call the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith, there we find this flawed couple who made so many mistakes, struggled so much, so much brokenness, but God still redeems it. He did it for them. He'll do it for us. He'll, he'll do it for you. Hebrews 11, verse 11. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead. That's wow. a mean thing to say about an old man, I'm telling you. He is as good as dead. He's 100. Good, good, good as dead. Came descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Could we pray for you? And could we pray for those of you that are married as well? Lord, I pray for each person watching this, that uh, this is for everyone this story that even when we make mistakes, you still can, can work that together for good in the end, like you did for Abraham and Sarah. And Lord, I pray for the marriages especially. Lord, help us to, with your help, put these principles into action because that brings blessing. But then Lord, thank you that even when we fall short of that, in Christ we can be forgiven and we can hand you the broken pieces and you can put them back together again, once again. Thank you for what a gracious and merciful and loving God you are. Mm -hmm. And we pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.